Many times in our lives, dads, we either do one or two different things. Either we work so hard to provide for our families, or we put our life on coast mode because we have our families. So today we're going to talk to our dads and to the moms and to our students. And we're going to be talking about relationships. And whether you are married or not, whether you're a teenager or not, you can still apply these simple plans for your life. Guys, what I want to teach you today is to absolutely have your wife or have your boyfriend or girlfriend absolutely fall in love with you with you hardly doing anything. Isn't that awesome? Wouldn't that be awesome if your husband or your wife would absolutely adore you and you really not do much at all? But here is the issue. Men and women keep score quite differently. Okay? I want to teach you this. Because when a man wakes up in the morning because he's getting up early and he wants to sleep in, to get up to get dressed, to go to work, he gives himself three thousand points. He gets up and he makes breakfast for himself because his wife is still in bed. And instead of his wife getting up cooking breakfast, he did it himself, so he gives himself a thousand points. He drives to work and he earns the money and he gets the paycheck and he comes home and he does what every good man does, hands his wife his paycheck, and he gives himself 10,000 points. He comes home and he, he's tired after he's doing that. So he's already made 34,000 points today. And he's thinking, I'm in the lead. My wife hasn't done anything, so I've got 34,000 points. So I'm going to set back, I'm going to chill out, and I'm going to watch TV until she catches up. Amen, guys? That's what we do. But the funny thing is, wives... They don't keep score the same way guys keep score. You get up in the morning. Because you're going to work, she sees that you get up. She gives you one point. <laughs> you get up and you cook breakfast. Because she didn't have to get up and cook breakfast, she gives you one point. Because you went to work, and because you picked up a paycheck, and because you gave her the paycheck when you got home, she gives you what? One point. There you go. One point. So you're looking at this and say, okay, so I'm sitting over here. I think I have 34,000 points. She has given me four points. But she also got up. She made the kids breakfast. She made the beds. She did the dishes. She did the laundry. She's over here giving herself one point, but she deserves all these points. So she's sitting over here saying, I've done all the work all day, and you haven't done anything. Why don't you get up, and why don't you mow the yard? Why don't you do all this other stuff? And you're sitting, I'm in the lead over here. And she's sitting over here and says, no, you're not in the lead. I'm in the lead. I'm keeping score. Your score is not right. My score is right. So the guy's sitting over here and says, I feel I have the shoulder of the family. I'm doing all this work, and she doesn't care. So what happens in the marriage relationship when one person is keeping score way out of kelter, somebody's keeping score and not giving any honor or respect to this, it starts with resentment. Do you see it? Do you see that she is mad because you're not working and you're mad because she is griping and all of a sudden you come home from work and you want a wonderful night and it's five hours of misery until you just say, I'm just going to bed to shut you up. Somebody give me an amen. amen. So it's, you guys are lying. You guys do the same thing. <laughs> to shut you up, I am just going to go to sleep. And then you wake up the next morning and it all starts over again. And all of a sudden, after about five years of keeping score improperly, we have a marriage that's in chaos. We have a marriage that's out of control because we're not looking at the same level. I want to give you the first thing is we need to avoid bitterness and resentment. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, 
tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself to us as an offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling savor. So you're looking at this, how do we get rid of the bitterness? How do we get rid of the anger? How do we keep score properly? I told you I was going to teach you men how to have a happy marriage, happy relationship without doing anything. We realize that women give us a point, right? For everything that we do, we get a point. So you come home from work. You stop by the store to get you some gas. So when you go in and pay for the gas, you pick up a Hershey's chocolate bar. You're already getting gas anyway, and you can pick you up one too. And you walk in the house and say, honey, I love you. I just was thinking of you. Here's a Hershey's chocolate bar. You know what she does? Ding! You say, oh, I get a point for that. So you, she cooks dinner. And you sit down at the dinner, and she goes, oh, I'm going to get up and do dishes. Say, Let me clear the table for you. Ding! 60 seconds, that dinner, oh, it's awesome. So she's up there doing dishes, and you walk up behind her, and you kiss her on the neck, say, honey, I love you. Ding! You get a point. You haven't even done anything yet. All you're doing is being nice. And then you can say, honey, what TV show would you like to watch tonight? Ding! <laughs> yeah, keep going. Keep going. So you're sitting there. You're just doing the natural thing. You walk into the bedroom, and she was tired, so the bed wasn't even made. I know that you got home late, but you go in, and you make the bed. Ding! You're a little slow. <laughs> So you make the bed and you sit on the side of the bed and you say this, honey, can we talk? <laughs> so she starts talking. And then instead of she aggressively starts talking, you, you say, is that right? <laughs> Ding. How does that make you feel? Ding, 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 goes crazy on that one. And then you say, you really don't. Oh, isn't it true that you told me last night that your friend Joanne was having a baby and the baby was doing okay and that you went to visit her in the hospital? You were actually paying attention? <laughs> you actually know one of my friend's names? You actually know what I did when I left? I'm getting ding, 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 ding all the time. You got all kinds of points and all you were doing is being nice. The next morning, you went to get her candy bar to get another point, And there was a red rose at the gas station. <laughs> so you picked up that red rose and you went home and you gave her the red rose. And she said, a red rose for me? Ding! You haven't done anything yet. You just picked up a dollar red rose. And you thought to yourself, if I can get a ding off a rose, I'm going to go spend $90. <laughs> and I'm going to pick up a dozen red roses and put them in a vase. And I am going to go give it to her. So you do that. And you put it on the counter. And you get home that night. And you know what? You didn't get any dings. You spent $90. So instead of spending $90 on 12 roses, you could have got 12 dings by buying a single rose 12 times. Women, would you rather have one rose 12 times or a dozen rose one time? Everybody takes the 12 because he's thinking of me. He loves me. So you're thinking this and well, it, by her score, I'm still behind. So what am I going to do? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to plan a weekend getaway. I'm going to have a babysitter planned at the house. I'm going to get the dogs taken care of. And I'm going to take her on a two-day excursion of wonderful bliss. It's going to be awesome. And I'm thinking to myself, am I going to keep that a secret? Or am I going to tell her? Which am I going to get the most dings out of? <laughs> And then she thought for a second, 
You can't keep a secret from a woman. That's an amateur hour. Let me tell you why that's amateur hour. Because if you tell her what you're thinking about doing, you're getting a ding. And then you get the ding, you tell her what's going on, and she's excited about it. You know you're going to get a ding. Because she's a woman, she's going to tell every one of her friends what he has planned for me. So he's gonna, she's going to tell five or six of her friends. So you're getting dings and points without even doing anything because she's excited about what you have planned for her. Now you're getting the points. Now the points are racking up. The thought process is this. What can I do to keep my points going forward? How can I keep score and not let the bitterness and the resentment to set in? Do you know what this is starting to do? If we would do this. You've changed your mindset of gaining points to keep away from the resentment and bitterness. Because if I'm always thinking, what can I do for her? Whether you get a point or not, it's not the point. The point is, you're thinking, what can I do to love her? What can I do to serve her? It's not a lot. It's just something that when I think of her, I know that if I do this for her, she's going to give me a ding. And the more dings I get, the better home I have. But here's what the women, you have to understand this. When men give you things to gain points, we have to think, what is it that a woman can do or give to a man to gain points? Other speaking than the obvious that we're not going to get into today, we're, we're going we're to talk about how can women give a man points. And Brenda mentioned it first. The first and foremost thing to keep resentment and bitterness out of the marriage relationship is honor him. Respect him. Praise him. He needs you to be his cheerleader. Not this. That's stupid. How could you ever think about that? And you young wives out there say, well, I always do that. But here's the point. When you get to be our age, you haven't heard all the stupid things he's going to come up with yet. Okay, so when, when you hear all the stupid things that we old people come up with, you're going to say, whoa, 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 whoa. But we have to honor our husbands. We have to lift them up. We have to encourage them. We have to pray for them. We have to understand it honors each other when we each other honor you, you could never do that. Why would you do that? You haven't done that in years. You better hire somebody to fix that. My dad did it this way. Whenever we slam on our love, what we're doing is we're taking him down to the next level. And then you say, why don't you ever talk? Well, because every time I share anything with you, you slam on me. So it's easier for me to go talk to my buddies than it is talk to you. And then you're wondering why it is so quiet around the house at night. You're wondering why he wants to play games and watch TV instead of talk to you about significant issues. It's because every time we talk, we just hurt each other. Because men, although we look rough on the outside, we're very fragile on the inside and we have very fragile egos. And the person that we love the most, we want to honor us the most. And the person that we love the most, most times, do not honor us, but they cut us. And when we get cut, we get hurt. And when we get hurt, we clam up. We're like a little dog. You may spank that dog and that dog's going to run out. That dog is going to still love you. But that dog may end up being afraid of you. Because here's the issue. When you tell a man he's no good, he has stupid ideas, that'll never work. There's going to be somebody that will like his ideas. That somebody may be at work or that somebody may be in the gym but that somebody will say, wow, I wish my husband had those ideas. I wish my husband was as smart as you. Because affairs do not start in the bedroom. 
affairs start emotionally because somebody needs significance. And when we are not getting significance from the home, we may not go out and look for significance, but somebody will give us significance. And if my pride and my ego is built up at work, but torn down at home, where do you think I want to spend my time? Where it's bitterness and resentful and anger and fighting? Or someplace where, hey, man, you're looking good today. You're one smart guy. Man, I wish I could do that. Because we hang around with people that make us feel good. So wives be our cheerleaders. Men honor our wives. I mean, doing that, we understand that opinions of each other, we may vary, but we can talk about those issues. If we have anger and bitterness and resentment in our home, we have to be able to talk. We're not going to live in a fairy tale world, but we have to live into a real world. And a real world is somebody that would say, you know what, we do have some issues, but those issues can be resolved. So, the next point, other than resentment and bitterness, is we have to keep the reset button close. You know what the reset button is? Al uses this all the time. It's called in golf, it's called a mulligan. Okay? Uh, we were playing with Luke, his grandson, golf this week, and um, Al was getting beat bad by Luke. I mean, and every time Al hit a bad shot, Luke would say, you can hit another one, have another mulligan. Have another mulligan. I said, hey, Luke, come on, dude. We're playing Al. He can't have redos every hole. It, he needs to play a little bit of golf. And, and Luke, being in high school, he said, yeah, but he's grandpa. He's old. He needs some help. So we kept on giving Al mulligan after mulligan after mulligan. It's called a redo. A redo. A reset, if you would. When my boys were young, uh, I used to like playing video games. And, uh, and when my oldest boy was getting about six years old, he said, Dad, can I have a controller? Maybe he's five years old. I said, yeah, you can have a controller. So I, I gave him a controller. I said, just a second. And I went to the back of the, uh, the controller, and I put it there, but I didn't plug it in. I gave him the controller. I said, you're ready to go. So I got over there, and I was having fun. I was playing the game, and I was winning. And he sat over there just smiling, thinking he was playing the game. About two months after I did that, he said, Dad, think my controller's busted. I said, why? He said, because it does not respond. I said, respond? He's getting smarter than I thought he was. <laughs> so I said, well, let me go see what's wrong. So, oh, well, somebody unplugged it. So he plugged it back in. He goes, oh, much better, much better. And every time that he started playing, he started getting better, and he started getting better, and he started getting, by the time he was seven years old, he was beating me in these stupid games. And so I thought, I can't be that bad at this. And so... I started playing a little bit, and he would get ahead of me, and I'd catch up. And, and then sooner or later, when he really got a lot better than me, he didn't have remorse for me. He, he would beat me by 30,000 points. And, and I would say, oh, I'm sorry. And I pushed the reset button. <laughs> it's as if it never happened, right? I just playing. So he got tired of that because he was just beating me. And I said, okay, Brett, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to start playing Tiger Woods Golf. I can beat you in golf any day of the week. Well, that little toad <laughs> at seven years old was beating me at Tiger Woods Golf. And I said, well, let's go out and play the real game then. Nope. So I said, okay, what do I got to do? What do I got to do? What do I got to do? I know what I'll do. I'll go down and change the settings. I'm going to put him at amateur and me at professional. I can hit the ball 330 yards straight down the fairway, and he can only hit the ball 150 yards. I can beat him this way. So we played a couple times, and he said, Dad, why are you hitting off black and I'm hitting off white? I said, well, it's just the way the controllers are. He goes, Dad, I think you're cheating. <laughs> I said, no, no, Dad would never cheat. Would never cheat like that. And the little toad kept on beating me. So, um, tells me about Matthew chapter 6. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Don't we wish we could have that reset button in our life? Don't you wish when things go out of control in our marriage, 
in our relationship, before we let that bitterness and anger and wrath catch up, we have enough guts to say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Don't we wish we could go back and say something different? Complete something that we should have started. Couldn't we just shut up instead of continue to talk? Don't you wish that time that you were in a fight and that you were so mad and you wanted to be right so much and you said what you shouldn't have said? You've done what you shouldn't have done. Don't you wish you could take that back? Don't you wish your life had a reset button to get back to where it was before? When someone hurts, we want them to pay. Sometimes when we want them to pay because of the bitterness and the anger, we're caught in the selfish mode of, I'm trying to win. And husbands and wives, we lose when they lose. We win when they win. When we are their biggest cheerleader, when they are hurting, we pick them up. When our kids are struggling, dads, we lift them up and we help them. We do not tear them down. The only one that hurts is the one that will not forgive. See, bitterness and anger and unforgiveness destroys us. It doesn't destroy the person that caused the offense. What happens is that bitterness and unforgiveness and anger is a sore, it's a poison that we take every day and it's destroying us on the inside. And what happens when that bitterness and that anger and that resentment and that unforgiveness takes over in our life, we start looking at everyone through the lens of that one that has hurt us. Somebody else is going to hurt me. Somebody else is going to hate me. Somebody else is going to betray me. So we put on those goggles and those lens of unforgiveness and bitterness and we walk around our life thinking nobody loves me or nobody will respect me or nobody will care for me. In Matthew 6 it says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. See, when we look at what forgiveness is, Forgiveness is an act. It is an act. It's not an emotion. It's an act. Which means I decide to forgive. It's not I feel like I want to forgive you. Because even though somebody has wronged you through bitterness and anger in the home, it's an act of forgiveness that says, I love you and I am going to forgive you. Forgiveness not, does not erase your memory. Uh, you might still remember the pain. But forgiveness is a fact. And it is not an eraser. Forgiveness means this. To never use it against me again. God has said it this way in Micah 7.19. He will have compassion on us. And will subdue our iniquities. And you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. And that's why the songs that we sing see the sea of forgetfulness. Because when God forgives us, he passes all of our sins and he puts it into the sea of forgetfulness. Forgetfulness is, I forgive you. I will never use it against you. I will never speak of it again to you. Forgiveness has to do more with the tongue than it does with the heart. It has to do with, I make a choice what to do and how to do it. If you're still talking to others about an offense against you, you have not forgiven them of the offense. Well, let me boil things down. The nuts and bolts. Getting rid of bitterness and beginning to forgive. Here are four simple steps to do that. Confess your bitterness as sin. Confess your bitterness, your anger, and your resentment as sin. 
to God. Name it and claim it, and God already knows it. It could sound something like this. Lord, I'm mad. I'm hurt. I'm struggling. I don't know what to do. The thing that he or she did against me hurt me to the core. And I know that I could put on a face and I know that I could act great, but Lord, it hurts. And we have to acknowledge what that is and confess our bitterness as sin. And when we confess our bitterness as sin, God can change our hearts and change our lives. In Hebrews chapter 12, pursue peace with all people and holiness. Without each one, no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone shall, fort, shall fall short of the grace of God. Let any root of bitterness springing out cause trouble. And this being defiled, we must seek peace with God. Ask God for strength to forgive your spouse and diligently seek that forgiveness. God cannot forgive you because I ask God to forgive you. I can pray for you all day long. God will not forgive you because I ask God to forgive you. Forgiveness is an act of God's will from my heart to you heart, your heart. But here's what the deal. When I ask God to forgive me because I am wrong, God is willing to forgive me. The only way that we can ask God to do something is God change their heart, break their life. Let them see that forgiveness. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Make a list of your hurts and find a time to talk to your spouse about it. Ooh. Now, if we're back at the start of the sermon where you're doing the points and she's keeping points and she's mad at you because you're not doing anything and you're mad at her because you think you're shouldering the whole house and, and you get home at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock and your whole house is in chaos and you're fighting about every little thing because you don't care what they think and you want to do what you want to do. Do you think you'll ever be able to do this? Do you think you'll ever be able to say, we got some grievances and we need to talk? Not fight. Fighting doesn't fix anything. But I have some things that hurt me. And I need to talk to you about them. Because if we're at war, that would just cause bigger war. But if we're in a point where we're loving each other, we care for each other, and we want the best for each other, honey, I just need to talk to you. I, I'm hurting. Because here's the deal. If somebody at your workplace would come to you and they're struggling, and they're hurting, and they would say, I need to talk to you. You would say, okay, let, let's, go, let's go on break. You'd sit across the coffee table and you would sit with them and talk to them and help them because they are hurting. But the person you love the most, when they are hurting, because of resentment and bitterness in your marriage, what you say is, I don't care to talk to you. You caused all those problems. And what happens, we flip the switch of love and emotion and all of a sudden we are cohabitating, we're non-divorced, we're living in the same house because we're not willing to talk. That bitterness, that anger, and that wrath has taken over. Make a list of your hurts and find a place and a time to talk to your spouse about it. If you can't let go, somebody will let go. If you can't find a solution, another solution will be given to you. Whenever you are broken, and you ask for forgiveness. And that person offers that forgiveness. And you start working on the light of rehabilitation and reconciliation. What happens is a true love happens. See, we talk about this spiritually. But I also want to apply it to it in our marriage. So often we get married and everything's wonderful and going good. And you start your family and you start your new career and everything's going good. And all of a sudden major calamity takes place in every home. There's going to be major calamity. Whether you like it or not, whether you think it'll happen to you or not, but major calamity will happen in every home. What do you do with that calamity? And most people, either they draw closer together or they fight so much they fall apart from each other. 
And what happens, and whenever they come apart, what happens, that brokenness is not used by God. But when a calamity takes place, a death of a child, an issue with the marriage relationship, finances, when we come together and we are broken, and we say, I cannot do this alone. We are married. We are a team. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it says, we become one flesh. So we have to do this together. That calamity turns into brokenness. And brokenness turns into unity when we come together and not fight. So when something takes place, instead of getting mad, instead of allowing the bitterness and the anger and the wrath to take over, allow the brokenness to take over and let God do what God can do. And the last thing is worry about changing yourself, not your spouse. Yeah, but if you would quit doing that, if you would just stop that, if you didn't do this, or if you didn't do that, and all of a sudden we start trying to fix our spouse, and I don't want you to fix me. So if you don't like what I have, you can hit the door. I don't really care. And all of a sudden, because you're trying to fix what I don't want to change, we start having issues within our marriage. So what we have to do is we have to look at, Lord, I need you to fix me. And I need you to look at him. And I want him to be who you want him or her to be. You are not God. You're not going to change somebody's mind. But God can do that. In Matthew chapter 7, we used this a couple weeks ago. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye when you don't even consider the plank that's in your own eye? Sometimes we look at the faults of others and not look at our own issues. The same way God wants to change you, God loves you. And God can use some of the major issues within your life, within your marriage, to make your marriage something that's sweet. Now I want to close with a phenomenal illustration from the Bible. David, the king of Israel. He had five wives. So he what? He's stupid, number one, but he had five wives. Why anybody would do that would be crazy in the first place, but he had five wives. And you would think about those five wives. The lineage of our Messiah is coming through David. He had five wives, so I'd wonder which one of those wives would that be? And the first wife that he had, they got in a fight and they quit having relationships. And then he had an affair. He had an affair with Bathsheba. And even in the writers of the Bible, when they listed the lineage they listed all the lineage and they got to Bathsheba's name. They wouldn't even list Bathsheba. They said the wife of Uriah. Because of the sin. Because of lust, lying, adultery, and murder. You look at that. But yet God chose Bathsheba to be the mother of Solomon. The wisest man who ever lived. There was nothing holy, nothing righteous. It should never have been God's plan to use somebody that was in that situation to do something so great. But he did. He did. He chose Bathsheba to be Solomon's mother and the great, great, great grandmother of Jesus. That doesn't compute to me. But why is that? Listen, to this. because God's love can change the biggest mistake and turn it around something that is so good that is uncomprehendable for anybody that sees it. Your mistake, your life, your issue, your marriage. God can take your biggest calamities and your biggest mistakes and he says, I understand they're broken. But in Psalms chapter 51, when David cried out and asked God to forgive him, he was forgiven, period. 
God looked at him as if he sinned no more. And God allowed every part of his life to still be blessed. And even the sin of Bathsheba, the sin of murder, the sin of lust, God says this, it is horrendous. But I love you. And I'm going to allow the sin that you committed to be forgiven. And I'm going to restore you to a point that's uncomprehendable. Bathsheba is going to be the grandmother of our Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone that will ever say, you've done too much. God would never forgive me. God will never use me. Well, let's go back to David and Bathsheba. Affair, lust, and murder. And God said this. I want to use you anyway. I want to restore you. I want to give to you love. And I want to give to you forgiveness. Maybe they'll look at you. And maybe they won't understand you. But it's not about what people think. It's what God thinks. Have you been to a point where your marriage relationship or any one of your relationships are at a key point where, man, it's just not good? She's not happy. It seems like all we're doing is fighting and arguing and complaining and six hours of misery every night. I don't even want to come home. And everything is just in turmoil. We're married. She sleeps over there and he sleeps over here. and They never do anything together. And just what we do. But guess what? You're not happy. And God wants our marriages to thrive Fathers, he wants us to take the initiative to love, to honor, and encourage. He wants us to be the man that God wants us to be, to be the leaders of the home. And he wants us to be broken to the point is I will do whatever I have to do to love you, to help you, to be your biggest cheerleader. And when the husband is the wife's biggest cheerleader, the wife then becomes the husband's biggest cheerleader. And instead of saying you can't, she says let's do it together. Instead of not doing anything, you do things together. You start doing the dishes together and making the bed and playing and kissing and doing marriage right. That causes hope to the kids, joy to our hearts, love to God. Because God wants our marriages to thrive. Satan wants our marriages to drown. And in many homes, whether it's Christian or non-Christian, Marriages are stinking, falling apart because Christians are not focusing on God. They're focusing on self. If God can use Bathsheba to be in the lineage of Christ, you have never done anything as bad as David and Bathsheba has done. And God loves them. And God loves you. And he wants to restore your home he wants to restore your marriage, your relationships, because he loves you. The calamity that you have faced, the stuff that you have done, you know what you have to do? Lord, it's yours. I'm tired of it. My marriage is yours. My kids are yours. I want to be the dad you want me to be. I want to be the husband you want me to be. I want to be the Christian you want me to be. I want to be the right way. I want to do it the right way. And the only way that we can do it the right way is get out of the driver's seat, get on our knees and say, Lord, forgive me. I want my marriage, my relationships, my kids to see the man and the woman that God wants us to be. I want to pray for you. And after we pray, we're going to have a time of invitation, a time of prayer. And if I would say this at a marriage conference, I would say this. Every marriage, every relationship needs tune-ups. So often, we drive our cars until the lights come on, so the check engine light comes on, or change the oil light comes on. It gives us an indication that we have driven our car too far without a tune-up or without a change of oil. In our marriages, that light that flashes 
Maybe the arguments that you have at your house. Maybe those cold nights that you spend. It may be some major calamities that we're sticking our head in the sand. And if it be our car, they'd be flashing to say, change oil or check the engine. And I told my boys early on, when you're driving the car that I buy for you, and that check engine light comes on, stop driving the car. Right? I don't want you to blow the motor up because you're too ignorant to stop driving the car. Couples, your flashing light is going off. Stop driving the car. Take the car to the mechanic. Get your life, your marriage, your relationships fixed. And then you can get back in your car and drive. Dear Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your love to us. I thank you for what you can do within our lives, in our marriages, in our homes. We don't want to be keeping points and keeping score and being miserable. We want you to honor us and love us and help us. We want you to take care of our life, take care of our marriages, take care of our relationships. Change us. Allow us to forgive ourselves and forgive those around us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to please stand to your feet. I could probably tell you a lot of couples that would say, I wish I would have done something different. I wish I'd have made some changes. I wish I'd have put the focus where it needed to be. But they did not. And sometimes they are either miserable or divorced. So before it's too late, let's do what God has asked us to do. Ask God to direct us, love us, and help us. And we need to be in God's way, in God's will. Not our way, and not what I want, but what God wants. And how we get that is by prayer. Seeking God's face. So we're going to spend a couple minutes in prayer. If you want to come forward, please do. With your family, with your kids, or by yourself. Spend time with prayer, asking God to fix us. On this Father's Day, the greatest Father's Day present we could ever get is a family that loves each other thrives with, you, with each other and wants to enjoy each other. That's the family that God wants you to be.